Lord Bingham in his 2010 book identifies the core of the rule of law principle as being that all persons and authorities within the state whether public or private should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly and prospectively promulgated and publicly administered in the courts. Lord Bingham later in his book talks about the eight sub rules of the doctrine of the rule of law. These rules are discussed here and you can find a summary of these rules at the Bingham Center for the rule of law website. The first rule is that the law must be accessible and so far as possible intelligible, clear and predictable. The reason that it is important that the rule be accessible, clear and predictable is because the law can act as guidance to the citizens how they should act. The second principle states very clearly that the questions of legal right and liability should ordinarily be resolved by application of the rule of law and not the exercise of discretion. It is important to note that the rule of law is undermined when laws are applied to events that have already taken place. However, there is hope for the rule of law with Article 7 of ECHR according to which the courts will apply the law with the presumption that it does not have a retrospective effect. The third principle states that the laws of the land should apply equally to all, save to the extent that objective differences justify differentiation. This point indicates that law should apply equally to all unless there is an objective reason not to do so. A good example can be a citizen with a mental disability or children who are treated differently when executing the law. Lord Bingham provides some discretion to officials in performing their duty while upholding the rule of law. The fourth rule states that the ministers and public officials at all levels must exercise the powers conferred on them in good faith, fairly, for the purpose for which the powers were conferred without exceeding the limits of such powers and not unreasonably. This rule can be best understood as directions given to the courts so they can decide cases dealing with delegated powers granted to officials by the parliament. Therefore, the citizens can challenge ministers by using the tool of judicial review and find protection against acts that are targeted towards them by the public officials. The fifth rule states that the law must afford adequate protection of fundamental rights. With the enactment of the Human Rights Act and the influence of ECHR in the continental Europe, the fundamental rights have become a modern reality. The sixth rule states that the means must be provided for resolving without prohibitive cost or undue delay bona fide civil disputes which the parties themselves are unable to resolve. Civil disputes in the legal system have always faced the challenge of cost and delays. This burden has been reduced to some extent by the practice of an alternative dispute resolution. Still, it is the right to have access to the legal system. In R versus Lord Chancellor, ex party Witham, 1998, the applicant challenged Lord Chancellor in his effort to increase the cost of writs. Justice Law stated that access to the court was a constitutional right. He further elaborated the idea that it can only be taken away by the parliament by enacting a law with an express provision. The irony in this case is that when the case was discussed in 1998, Lord Chancellor had a more active role in upholding the rule of law. But the measure proposed by him was set to undermine the rule of law. It is important to remember that with the passage of Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, the role of Lord Chancellor has changed. The seventh rule is self-explanatory. It states that the adjudicative procedures provided by the state should be fair. The eighth rule says that the rule of law requires compliance by the state to international law as in national law. The last rule is directed towards the state in an effort to curb its power both internationally and domestically. Lord Bingham's writing set out the historical development of the idea of the rule of law. The book harshly criticizes the Iraq invasion and the Bush administration in the US as undermining the rule of law. The book also discusses the Belmarsh case. The case began with nine men who challenged a decision of the Special Immigration Appeals Commission to eject them from the country on the basis that there was evidence that they threatened national security. 
They were detained by the executive branch at the Belmarsh prison. All were arrested and detained under the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act 2001. The powers provided by the Act allowed indefinite detention of terror suspects without deportation and trial. The powers applied only to non-British citizens. The House of Lords held by a majority that while the detention was lawful under the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act 2001, Section 23 was incompatible with the Articles of European Convention on Human Rights. As a consequence, the House of Lords made a declaration of incompatibility under Section 4 of the Human Rights Act 1998 and allowed the appeals. Professor Mark Elliott does an excellent job in explaining the Belmarsh case. He uses the case as an introduction to public law. You can find the link to these videos on our blog section. Before I end this lecture, I would like to put out the definition of rule of law given by the Oxford English Dictionary. The restriction of the arbitrary exercise of power by subordinating it to well-defined and established laws. This definition provided us with the main takeaway from the doctrine of the rule of law.